So, uh, yeah, so hello, I'm Marty Johnson. Uh, I am a science communicator. I'm a freelance science communicator. That is what I call myself these days. Um, and it all goes back to the dim and distant years of 1996. I know that because I just looked it up. Um, in 96, I finished my PhD. That was the year I finished my uh, PhD at the John Innes. So I was at Cell Biology, my PhD. And at the end of my PhD, I realized that actually, for my love of science and my love of doing the science, the research science, I was always going to be better at talking about or writing about science. I knew that because the, the first draft of my, my thesis I thought was fantastic. It was funny, it was full of jokes, uh, but they all got cut. <laughs> uh, ended up, what happened is I ended up going to the science center where James was working, along with a few other people. And uh, I volunteered there, just like he's encouraging people to volunteer right now. And I, um, I that was when I first got my my chance to sort of talk to the public about science, I guess. And from there, gosh, then what happened? I went off. I did a stint on Tomorrow's World uh, as uh, to do some work experience on Tomorrow's World, and then I got a job at the Edinburgh International Science Festival, the Edinburgh uh, Science Festival. I, and the thing was, science communication didn't kind of, it kind of wasn't a thing. Like when I came and I first met you, it was kind of, it was this kind of weird thing that a few people were doing it. And so I don't think there was a point, but I think when I got to Edinburgh and I was, I was doing shows in kind of weird schools in the middle of nowhere. And at the end of a, the show, kids would be like so excited and they'd be oh, so cool. I want to do science. I want to be a son. And you just, one person says that and you just catch it or they come up and tell you and that's it. Boom, job done. And you think, wow, okay, that is, that is the most amazing feeling. And I want to, I want to carry on doing that. I came uh, to Norwich to study at the John Innes in uh, 2014. Um, and my research was on um, the friendly relationships between legume plants, so including peas and beans, um, and um, nitrogen fixing bacteria. And in the last year of my PhD, I went along to a science blogging workshop that had been organised by some fellow students. Um, and this workshop inspired me to give blogging a try. Um, and um, I set up my own blog. Um, the more I practised, uh, the more, the easier it became really. And the more I started to enjoy it and look forward to my next opportunity to sit down and write. Um, and then, so by the end of my PhD, I'd realized that although I really enjoyed uh, working in research, I also really enjoyed communicating science and actually the communication side of things was more fun and rewarding than working at the bench for me. So I started applying for jobs in science communication. Um, I managed to get a job um, for um, eLife Sciences, so that's the Life and Biomedical Science Journal. One of the aspects of the job I particularly enjoyed um, was uh, working on eLife Digests, which are plain language summaries that are included within um, many of the research articles that eLife publish. In, in 2017, I um, went off on maternity leave and I had my first child. And at the end of that maternity leave, I was trying to work out what to do next. And I was really torn because I really enjoyed my job at eLife. Um, but I also wanted to do some work that was maybe a bit more flexible around my family life. Um, so I um, decided in the end um, that um, I'd go freelance instead and then I could work from home. I had a part time job in a shoe shop of all places when I was just finishing up my A-levels. And I mentioned that because that thing about being able to go up to someone and chat or ask them something is just so important. And I think for me, that's where I just was thrown into the deep end and had to learn how to do that. I was actually pretty shy, which might surprise some of you on the call today, but um, I had to sell shoes. I had to make my targets. So I had to smile and be friendly. And I kind of worked out that that was a real thing that would help you in all areas of your life came to work at John Innes after finishing my degree and actually finishing it I did a master's as well at UBA um, I came to work at John Innes and this was in 2000 and there was a major storm um, going on in the media about GM food and franking foods and all of this stuff and some of the people on the call might remember that and I was in a group that was looking at the stability of transgenes in oilseed rape in brassicas and we were kind of in the middle of this storm and 
there was all kinds of negative stuff in the press. And we realised just how terrible it was that people didn't really get, uh, people, you know, the general public didn't really understand what was going on. We weren't doing a very good job as scientists of communicating what we were doing. Um, so those two kind of things came together. And, and also I have this innate thing where I just say yes to things and then worry about if I can do them afterwards, which is a good, <laughs> that's kind of my mantra. But I also found over the years that I was developing all kinds of additional skills. Um, so I highly recommend that thing that has already been mentioned about volunteering for opportunity. I mean, it can lead you into some hot water if you spend too much time doing your outreach and not doing your lab work. So that there's a balance to be had. And for me, that came later on. I ended up making this thing called Women of the Future Conference with a team of women. And it was so great. We had this incredible day, wonderful speakers, uh, all women from all over the UK in different STEM areas. But I knew there was an issue. And one of the things about doing outreach is you put all this effort into making these one off activities. And I, I just thought, well, what what happens after that day? What happens when the kids go home? Where's the long term impact? How do you get them to reflect back and put it on their CV and become role, model, role models themselves? So we launched together with Simon uh, Fox, who's also a PhD uh, graduate from John Innes Centre and my husband and was a head teacher at the time. We we founded something called the Youth STEM Award. And now John Innes was hugely supportive and from that uh, became what I now run. So it's a it's a STEM skills award. It's a bit like the Duke of Edinburgh's type of award, for, but for STEM. Um, and we have schools across the UK taking part. I'm not actually a JSC alumni. I'm currently employed at the John Innes Centre. Um, I joined in 2017 um, and I've got a relatively similar career path, I think, to some of the others on the panel, but um, in a diff completely different field. So um, I studied environmental science um, at the University of Leeds. I didn't do very well in my A-levels. I almost failed and I was really, really over the moon when I got a position, a place at, Le at Leeds Uni um, and then I ended up graduating. I kind of got myself together a bit after A-levels and um, got a 2-1 in, in my undergraduate degree. And more importantly, during my degree, I discovered a love for field work and um, we had some really great lecturers at Leeds who um, kind of led the field, so not, no pun intended, in field work. Um, so we ended up doing quite a lot of field work courses in our, my undergrad and during one of those in my third year, I just, I'm a bit like Sam, I sort of say yes to stuff. Um, I take opportunities and I I just approached the head of department during this field course and said, oh, you've got any, I really like this. Can I do some more field work? Um, I'm happy to volunteer. And he sort of said, oh, well, maybe we've got some funding that we're trying to get to do some field work in Switzerland in the summer. And luckily he got that funding and I got to go and work in Switzerland for um, just for one month. During my PhD, I again did exactly the same as everyone was sort of saying, just said yes to loads of opportunities. So ended up doing some outreach with schools. And I also really, really enjoyed writing my thesis and editing my thesis, which I think um, amongst my peers at the time was a bit of an unusual phenomena. So I realised I was a little bit different to everyone else. Ended up staying at the university, working for um, a NERC funded research centre called the National Centre for Atmospheric Science um, as their um, uh, training and development manager. I can't even say it. The volcano that erupted in Iceland in 2010, I think you say it, <laughs> um, erupted and our communications manager had been on secondment and had left. So I ended up being the communications manager when my boss was being called into SAGE meetings because our organisation had the only aircraft that was allowed to fly during the ash plume over the UK because we had technology that could measure the ash plume and so we managed between me and my director we managed about 25 calls a day for about six weeks from the media and he was also in and out of SAGE meetings and speaking to the government and advising them and we were dealing with the data and I just absolutely loved working with the media and under those kinds of pressure sort of in the crisis communications kind of area. 2017 um, the job came up at the John Innes Centre I wasn't really looking for a new job but I wanted to move back to Norfolk. My parents and all my family live in Norwich, so I yeah, took a took a chance and applied for the job, and here I am. So I now manage the team, which includes James and a few other people, to deliver a really broad range of things across 
everything from um, yeah courses for year 10 science camp students to um, press and media uh, videos and websites and um, yeah anything really anything where we talk to people or there's images or videos that's kind of our job so that is a very brief overview of how I got here. So general tips for being a science communicator if, if that's sort of what you're asking. Um, firstly I would echo this idea about building up your network but also building up your brand I think that's the if you you are your own brand uh, so being out there is really really important I would definitely echo uh, being on Twitter and Facebook and everything and 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 touch you've got to be available for work so you need to be um, be able to have uh, if you want to do freelance work for example you need to be set up for that and it's never too early by the way um, and also just networking more generally really um, there's you know um, you can get so much work by sort of through people that you already know through I mean through the research you're doing you'll be writing about your research um, you know and so if you're interested in writing you're already doing some practice which is great um, and um, you know if you're if you're doing experiments can you turn that experiment into something that you can um, you know either maybe film yourself doing it or or kind of or potentially um turn it into an outreach activity you can do with schools and things like that there's all sorts of things that you can be sort of that you might be doing anyway that you can then twist and then kind of actually use it as a sort of science communication activity and just practice so you're doing research at the moment practice your elevator pitch be able to talk about your research you know get your two minute kind of this is what I do and just practice 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 and take the opportunities. I think some of the stuff I learned during my PhD particularly with all the field work and things going wrong that's something you can guarantee particularly with public engagement or um, you know schools activities things are going to go wrong and you learn in your PhD that you've got to just pick yourself back up dust yourself off go again and like use what's going wrong to your advantage and I think that's certainly something I've taken from failing uh, experiments in my PhD. You don't need a PhD, you don't need a master's. In television, nobody cares. I don't get, I don't even put my doctorate in front of my name anymore because nobody, nobody cares. Uh, they don't want to know, they just want to know, can you do, can you do it? Can, uh, can you perform? And actually what I do has got nothing to do with my science background. It's to do with um, its performance. This is a performance. Right. There's probably a slight tipping point of, do you want to be the expert? That you, who's passionate about a subject who wants to communicate that subject or do you want to be a brilliant communicator uh someone like marty so people other people i work with who don't have phds maddie Mo does children's television absolutely brilliant communicator she doesn't even have a degree in science but is brilliant at communicating uh so i think it's about looking at yourself and thinking well, where do i sit maybe on that some people can do both and balance uh uh, a career that you know P professor brian cox P uh, alice roberts um people who are uh, who are um, mark Midovnik, who who manage research as well as doing communications they're fairly rare there's such a huge spectrum of jobs and they um like things you can do in science communication um and every day i see someone on twitter or someone somewhere doing a different niche of science communication both within an institute or a university uh, or as a freelancer a lot of people like James do a bit of both or kind of flip between one and the other. So you do a few years freelance and then you might pick up a job that becomes kind of your career or your your paid employment for a longer time. I'll do a couple of plugs. Um, Big, the uh, STEM skills network is definitely worth a Google and a join. There is a really good um, GISC mail list, SciCom, which is worth looking at. Lots of jobs come up on there, particularly jobs based in universities and research institutes. There's a huge growth in the market for science communicators in that kind of area now and also not necessarily as was the case probably 10 years ago where it had to be someone who'd done their PhD at that place who got the job it's really changed you, yeah t do whatever you love I think that's always when you have these career sessions if you think something is brilliant and you're fascinated by it go with it like just search yeah. out every opportunity to do it if you if you want to and say yes to opportunities